Yeah, well, everything changed completely uh, in 1979, and it was a very um, uh, important position, and it was a, a crucial position, in fact. gave me a lot of opportunities, because it would have meant weekly meetings with George Thomas, a second state for Wales, and I'll come to that later, Transport House in London, with Sir Harry Nicholas, the General Secretary, Gwyn Morgan, who of course was a famous Welshman, who later became the uh, uh, Welsh, Welsh Commissioner in Europe, and uh, Ron Hayward, the new General Secretary, meetings with Parliamentary Party Group in London. So all that now started growing, albeit it was only for a 14-15 month period, gave me a good insight into how the Labour Party was behaving and what its power structures were. And especially, it was a period, you said, we set up the Crowther Commission, which later became the Kimbrandon Commission, and we then needed to give evidence to it. Well, one of the earliest decisions made was that I was asked to head a group, a think tank group, to prepare the evidence for the Crowther Commission. And we selected six people, some interesting names in it. Alan Michael, uh, Flynn from Newport. Uh, the guy, I don't know whether he's still a member of parliament now, but he used to be down in Monmouthshire and he became a West Midlands MP. Bruce George. Uh, Wynne Thomas, who was the candidate in Merioneth, in, in Montgomery. And the son of one of the senior people in the tourist board in Wales, Gareth Howells. So it was a rather powerful group of people, intellectually strong, strongly committed to devolution. They picked the wrong group. They picked a strongly pro-devolution group to prepare our case. And Gradually, as the weeks and the months go on, it dawned on a lot of people in the Labour Party this group is going way beyond its remit and it's going to suggest an elected council for Wales with far more power than we are willing to even contemplate. To cut the story short, it went on for months, we were meeting for months, we were called before the Welsh Executive and I had to give reports of what the draft report was they were still not happy. We were called before the Welsh Labour Group of MPs because they were really up in arms. Because I would say of the 32 MPs, or whatever they were, 30s in those days, I doubt if <coughs> I doubt if 10 of the 30 were remotely interested in devolution. At least half of them were violently against any move towards. Uh, what was called then an elected council for Wales. Uh, the, anything beyond that, the names of assembly or legislative group or parliament was out. All they envisaged was a grand county council. That was their idea. That was what the name of the game was. Probably nominated if they could get away with it, rather than elected. Anyway, the record is there to show what the evidence of the Labour Party was. Uh, Gwyn Morgan threw his weight behind our report, uh, and he was the Assistant General Secretary. Um, it was watered down. It was not as powerful as we wanted, mm. but it was much more powerful than the Welsh Labour Group of MPs were willing to contemplate. So in effect, they lost. Eventually, for the final decision, before being sent to uh, the evidence to the Crown of Commission, there was a joint meeting of the Welsh Executive in Cardiff and a group, a representative group of the Welsh Labour Group of MPs. But the group, the think tank group that I headed, were from then on regarded as neo nationalists in many, many ways. They realised they had opened the door. And I suspect they probably regretted that they ever made me research a public relations officer. I, I, I got no direct evidence of that in terms of anybody telling me anything. But I knew from the general demeanour of George Thomas, 
and uh, Apsi and a few other people. I knew that they now had their eye on me and that I might have been a renegade in the camp and that I had gone further, that I was not a Labour loyalist, loyalist as the Welsh Labour group of MPs expected. They expected me as a candidate to toe the line, but they didn't realise that I was a strong devolutionist much, much further than uh, uh, what they ever knew. I was not, a, I was never have been for independent Wales, but I've always been for a federal Wales, and uh, they misjudged that. Anyway, opened the door to all these machinations, a lot of struggles, a lot of divisions. Some of it I managed to sweep into the papers via Clive Betts, and they appeared in the Western Mail from time to time, just to keep on the pot boiling. That's why you do that. These guys only win when they are in secret conflict. When nobody knows what they're up to, they are winning. When you work against them slowly and reveal what their intentions are, they get uncomfortable with that, they get pressures from other people, and they don't like that. So I, know, I knew how to play the game, that the more uncomfortable I made George Thomas feel, the better. The more uncomfortable I mean, made the anti-devolutionists in Parliament feel, the better. So I had to play a very tight line, because I was also cut into the commandment. You know, they could, uh, they could have um, dismembered me because of that or whatever. But I was doing such a good job in commandment, I suspect they dared not even contemplate doing that, even if, even if it had occurred to some people that that day we could deal with this guy, but they dared not do it. I but I came then into contact with Harold Wilson as Prime Minister. I spoke in events in Wales with him, rally in Newtown, rally in Aberystwyth, rally in Ebu Vale, um, and he and I got on very, very well. And in fact, he came to Carmarthen three times when I was Member of Parliament. Uh, we were very, very friendly. And there was the dichotomy, you see. I was friendly with Howard Wilson, pro devolutionist pro Welsh language. So was George Thomas, very friendly with anti-Welsh, anti-devolution. I think Howard Wilson must have been a bit of a schizophrenic because who was, who was saying the facts about Welsh life? Who to believe? I suspect he tended to believe more of George because George had 20, 25 Welsh Labour MPs behind him, mm -hmm. Apsi, Kinnock, all sorts of other people, Alan Williams in Swansea West. Oddly enough, the greatest surprise of all was Ivor Davis Gower, which really was a surprise to me. Ivor was not in favour of devolution. Uh, well speaker, uh, got on with him like a house on fire. Big friend, mm -hmm. could never persuade Ivor that, uh, that uh, devolution was good for Wales. Uh, he was nowhere near that. So, as part of my job, I had to update George all the time on two areas. One, how the devolution report was coming, how the, how the, and two, get information from him to feed out to the constituency parties as to how well the Labour government was doing. We won't have time in this interview to go down that road too much. But I did a pamphlet. I did a pamphlet on the whole thing after I became member of parliament. But that pamphlet was uh, done about 1972. But it really was a justification of what Labour had done, uh, because everybody said, "What a, what a rubbish of a government!" Plank and ridiculed them. Said nothing was done. They're anti Wales. They're pro London. Nothing gets done. Whereas in the middle of everything. A lot of strong, good things were done in Wales for which they never had the proper credit. Okay? But George gave me a lot of the information through Welsh office papers, mm. not uh, confidential papers, things that could be used. Mm. But then I came across a very, very strange man. You know, very strange. He, and I found myself in a difficult position. position. He had been twice to our home in Manorawod. My grandmother and mother thought the world of George because George had a way and a gift of making everyone love him and hiding how he really was. George was a pretty hypocritical person. 
you know, he, uh, he, he, he would operate against you. And when I went to his house, I had the shock of, his, of my life. Uh, he had a bungalow in uh, uh, King Coyne somewhere there, Heath, Heath Avenue or something. And I, had, and I went there 7, 8 o'clock every Sunday night mm. to have a briefing meeting with him uh, for about an hour. Mm. And he'd go into his main lounge. On the one side of the fire was a picture of the Queen. On the other side of the fire, the picture of the Prince of Wales. In the corner was his mother. Whenever he kept his papers to give to me, or in another room, every time, every time, and I mean every time, he would get up off his seat to go and get some papers. He first of all would go over and give his mother a kiss. So it was nothing for me to see George kiss his mother ten, ten times a night. You know, very, very odd. But okay, that was George. You know, uh, and I got on with him okay. It was later on in Parliament when uh, I then really motored a bit on the devolution thing that we started to lose contact and he then distrusted a group of us. All the well speaking MPs he distrusted totally. He thought that we were all nationalists and that we'd use the Labour Party to propagate the nationalist cause. But uh, yes, they were very interesting days and uh, I learned a lot about the Labour Party and it probably was the start of my dislike for the Labour Party when I realised, God, this is not a united party. This is at the end of the day actually not a nice party. It's full of, it's full of insidious people with their own agendas and it shook, it shook me. Maybe you could say, how naive is politics, man? Don't you, don't you understand that's the world you entered? No, I did not understand that was the world I entered. I was a straightforward candidate who believed that what I said was how it was, who everybody knew where I stood on language, devolution, Wales, uh, whatever it is. And you were taken for what you were. It wasn't like that. What do you say makes them decide are you good or bad. If you're not with us, you're an enemy. And very quickly after I became a member of parliament, I became an enemy. I didn't choose to be the enemy. They made me an enemy because I wasn't a conformist.